I know. I think we focus so much on on the sex and the consensual non monogamy, and really, what it is is being open to create whatever relationship you can with each person, and that can be acquaintance, that could be a good friend, you know, that could be somebody who who turns out to be like a life support for you, that could be somebody who's a lover for six months a year, you know. It's. I think it's the freedom of being able to explore relationships that um, that that you're not trying to just put them put people into pigeonholes. You're more looking at the person and seeing what develops naturally. The, I hate expectations, and I think consensual non-monogamy really removes a lot of expectations from relationships. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 275. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have a fun conversation with Susan. Susan is the executive director and founder of the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom, or NCSF, and she founded it in 1997. And this is a super powerful conversation. And we rarely say this. We've actually never said this. <laughs> Are you sure? I'm sure. You don't even know what I'm about to say. No, I don't. That's what I'm saying. Are you sure we haven't said it? I'm sure. Go get your kids, circle up and listen together. Uh, this, yeah. this is one of the most powerful conversations about activism, standing up for what you believe in, and examples of like how to get involved yes. and make real change. Yeah, and huge, huge differences. Yeah. So just a huge amount of gratitude to Susan and everybody at NCSF for all of the work that they do. And we're just we just love this conversation. And and so much of what we talk about is Susan's personal story and how it motivated her and drove her. To do the work she does. Exactly. She has been exploring ethical monogamy and kink for over 30 years. And so it's just an incredible discussion and we can't wait to share it with you. So without further ado, we're not going to dwell on it too much. There are links in the show notes to everything you could ever want to know about Susan and NCSF, how to join, how to find them, all of their social media links, their website, and on and on and on. We're not going to dwell on it anymore. Just a huge amount of gratitude, Susan. Thank you for coming on and thank you for the work you do. For anyone who's a premium subscriber, we're going to jump into the interview with Susan now. And for anyone else, you'll have to listen to a few quick announcements before we jump in. Only because you're not a premium subscriber, which you can become by scrolling down to the bottom of our homepage at normalizingnonmonogamy.com and you can sign up for as little as $2 a year. Yes. But for the rest of you who don't want to do that, well, you're in for a treat. (laughs) We're bringing the fun today. A few announcements. First up, we will be running a workshop at the upcoming Southwest Love Fest, April 14th to the 16th in Tucson, Arizona. We're super excited about this event. And actually, last week, if you missed last week's episode, go listen. We interviewed Kate, who is a co-founder of Southwest Love Fest. And next week, we will release an episode with Sarah, the other co-founder of Southwest Love Fest. So for more information about this event, go listen to either of those episodes. Or head over to our show notes and you can find links to sign up. Again, Southwest Love Fest is an annual conference on relationships, identity, community, and non-monogamy. It's going to be amazing. We're pumped to be going. And if you want to join us, because we're going to be there and it's going to be awesome, you can save 10% when you use the offer code EMMA at sign up, at checkout. Again, there is a full sliding scale for this and there's early bird until mid-March. So get in there now, get the best deals you can get, save your 10% and we'll see you in a couple of months. Links in the show notes. Also coming up, we have another virtual meet and greet. This is going to be on February 23rd. These are open to anyone. You just must be open-minded and respectful. We would love, love, love to have you join us to sign up, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, and click on the events tab. And for anybody who's never been to one of these, well, first of all, you're missing out. Yeah, come join us. Check it out. And the way that they work is 
we, Emma and me, find tons of fun questions. We put you into small breakout rooms with like three or four other people. We ask you a fun question. You talk about that question. We bring you back to the main room. We scramble the rooms. We ask you a new question. We do it again and we do it again and we do it again. And again and again. And again and again and again for about two hours. By the end of it, you've got so many friends you don't know what to do with. Your 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 Rolodex is just full <laughs> and you're swimming in amazing community. Yes. So we highly recommend it. Yes. And again, to find that was normalizing nonmonogamy.com. Click on the community tab. Nope. The events tab. I know. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> click on the events tab. The After, community tab. That's a great tab too. I'm going to tell them what happens when they click on that community tab on accident looking for the meet and greet tab. You will find all about our online community where we have an ongoing chat. We have monthly Q&As. We have men's groups, women's groups, and we also do some in-person events here and there too. And we're just super excited about this community. We love everyone who is part of it. You're all amazing. It's only five bucks a month to join. So go check it out. Again, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the community tab. And just while we're talking about the community, a huge thank you to the 250 plus members of the community who who support us every single day. And some of them may not be hearing this because they also get the premium membership for free. When you are a community member. Yeah. So thank you to all of you for being a part of it and being the highlight of our day and our week. We love all of the support that happens in there. We also love the the not safe for work photos. <laughs> it's super fun. We definitely fun. Don't, we definitely don't lurk. <laughs> anyway, I, now you're making it creepy. I lurk once in a while. Okay, now you're definitely making it creepy. I am. I will say this, though, about the NCSF. Ch- NCSF? Um, no. Nope, that's the interview today. That's the interview today. <laughs> <laughs> Just going to leave that in. The NSFW chat, the not safe for work chat. That's an amazing place for people to support one another. It I, is. I was not expecting that when we created it, but the 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 body positivity, the just the positivity in general it's that's awesome. that that's that mwah. <laughs> you, you, you kiss like you're a chef and this is why those of you who didn't sign up for the premium subscription may be regretting that now i think they're loving it <laughs> so join us again normalizing nonmonogamy.com click on the community tab i actually don't creep on anybody there now you're just trying to say face <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes, we already told you where to find it. Go check it out. We would love, love, love to have you join us. Last but not least, oh, you're going to say something. STDcheck.com, <laughs> our favorite way to get tested for STIs. Yes, last but not least, that was my what I was going to say next. This service is the way that Emma and I get tested for STIs. We absolutely love it. We've been using it for years. It's fast, it's easy, and at about $129 exactly, it is affordable when you use the links on our website and save yourself $10. Those links also help support the show financially, so we are super grateful for that. And, and we love you for that. Yes. And when you get tested, you can go and love anybody you want in any way you want because now you know enough about your sexual health that you can inform them. You can maybe send them the link. They'll get informed. Then they can inform you. Then everybody's happy and having amazing informed conversations about their sexual health. And then they have amazing sex. And it's all because of us. Good plan. Solid, and, solid, solid plan. And a bonus perk, we aren't lurking in the corners. <laughs> watching any of this happen we just we just love that you use the links and and got yourself tested yes thank you thank you and last last but not least least i guess is please reach out to us send us a voicemail send us an email we'd love to hear from you you can reach out to us at the contact us page on our website normalizing nonmonogamy.com and with that let's go are you ready i'm ready let's go and talk with susan Welcome, Susan, to the podcast. We're excited to talk to you today, and thank you so much for making the time and and for being here. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited to talk to you both. Do you mind introducing yourself to the listeners and to us? Because we we know very little about you, and we would love to learn more. Yes, of course. I'm Susan Wright. I am the executive director of the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom, and I actually founded NCSF in 1997. So I've been with this organization for 25 years and have been working on advocating for consensual non-monogamy and um, kink for all those years. Love it. Well, we are definitely going to talk more about NCSF and what you do there. But there's a, I'm going to guess if you founded an organization around that, that maybe there was some inspiration there. (laughs) 
<laughs> not, you're not just a do-gooder who's like, these non-monogamous folks, I think they need somebody out here battling for them. So what? Yeah, I'm Joan of what? Arc. I just like, I saw you <laughs> and I decided to save you, right? <laughs> well, we appreciate it. Um, so maybe take us back in time. What, what was your introduction to the non-monogamous or the kink world or both? Well, it kind of came simultaneously because, you know, a lot of people who are kinky are also consensually non-monogamous because we play in so many different ways that it really does open up those doors of sexual exploration. So for me, it was simultaneous. And um, I'm, I got into it through friends who um, I met through a an in-person role-playing game. You know, like it was based on the old Dungeons and Dragons, and then they, we would get together and we would take on these roles. And I just loved it. And they were like, hey, I think you'd like this. Why don't you come with us to this club? And so I just started going to these, um, you know, kink clubs, sex clubs. Some of them were mixed together. Some of them were very, you know, niche. Um, some of them were stand and model where you'd go and watch, look at other people and how they were dressed. And others were like big dance parties. So that was in New York City. And I really got the best introduction you could possibly get into this mayu. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. And it makes me wonder what what narratives you were writing for your role playing game that they were like, hey, <laughs> this this you, this you would like this. You would fit this in. This one belongs at the <laughs> sex clubs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's because I was able to just dive into it and really like um kind of lose myself in the fantasy of it and really get absorbed in it. And I think that that's what I find with people who are non-monogamous or kinky is they're just super creative with their sexuality mm -hmm. and really want to explore and try new things and kind of push yourself uh, in some ways to see, you know, why do I have a resistance to this idea? Okay, well, maybe I need to kind of dive into that a little bit more. So for me, it's been a super empowering self-exploration. Yeah. And, um, and it's still going on. Yeah, I love that. I'm curious that if you can think back to the to the first time, either to the first time they brought it up or the first time that like you're standing at the precipice, the front door of your first sex club. What what was that like for you? It was super exciting because I felt like in New York City anything is possible, right? You get that mm -hmm. sense of feeling. And then here I'm going, I'm being kind of ushered into this subculture that's kind of underground. And, um, I had a lovely introduction through a couple who I knew and they kind of took me under their wing. And so that was a wonderful way to do it too, is, is to have, um, have a couple introducing me to this dynamic. And yeah, and I sort of, I was pretty intrepid. So I, I sort of just dived right in and, uh, kind of marched through the jungle, like nothing was going to happen to me and nothing did, you know, I really, I made a ton of friends and, um, I really quickly, uh, started being an activist because, um, I was out it almost immediately. Um, somebody, I was trying to become a writer. I, I am a writer now. I ha I've had over 30 books published, but at that point I had wow. never had a wow. book published. Yeah. And so I was talking to publishers in New York city trying to get my first book published. So a publisher took me to dinner and said, you know, and I'm thinking, Oh great. He wants to publish my book. Right. And he kind of said something along the lines of, well, I've been told that you're dating this couple. So if you're dating them, that means you can date me. And I was like, Whoa. are you kidding me? Wow. Right? Like total Harvey Weinstein kind of gatekeeping kind of stuff, right? Way before yeah. we were aware that this was a problem. Um, and uh, and I was so shocked. I was just like, I thought you brought me to dinner to like talk about my book. And he's like, oh, no, if I was going to talk about your book, I would have taken you to lunch. Wow. <laughs> That's wow. so fucked up. I'm so Wow. <laughs> wow. <sighs> so I just, I actually was so upset. I actually just stood up in the middle of the dinner and I walked out and good for, good you. for you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's just because I'd been empowered and, and I was exploring this new world and, and I really felt like I was able to take it on my own terms. And I really had the wherewithal at that moment to just go, no, no. And I got up, walked out and, and it was a huge opportunity. He went on to publish somebody who became kind of fairly well known 
writing a series of books that I had kind of, you know, my high, I had wanted to write. And um, so that was a, a real loss. But then I ended up going on and writing for Star Trek. I wrote nine Star Trek mm-hmm. novels for the franchise and getting my own science fiction novels published. So in some ways that no really kind of set me on a different trajectory. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I like it's good for you for being able to do that. But like, I, I think it's interesting that you said like you felt empowered even like how, mm-hmm. how long into your exploration of this was that, that this, that this happened. It was in that first year. It, it was, wow. it was literally like six months, eight months later. Um, yeah. I, I was in a relationship at that point with the couple and, um, and it was just such a shock to the system. And I think that that's what happens to a lot of people. They don't, they get into this and they don't realize that there might be vulnerabilities and they get outed by somebody or they mm-hmm. out themselves. They t- start talking at work about it and say, Hey, I went to this great party, you know, like we want to share. Yeah. But then what happens is coworkers start talking to each other and then other coworkers start sexually harassing you. And then you become the distraction in the workplace and you get fired. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, every bit of myself fights against that. And that's one, one thing that NCSF helps people with because, you know, I've experienced it. I've experienced that discrimination and there is nobody else to fight for us, but ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Would would you be open to talking a little bit more about just the transition or the shift in your sort of empowerment? Like, like in a year, less than a year of sort of diving into that year, like what changes are you seeing in yourself? Well, I think I'm just going to add on to that a little bit is before, before you were introduced to this scene, kind of what was your, I guess, relationship life and your life like before this to kind of set the scene to, to go into that change? Well, yeah, I, I, that's a good question because I'd had quite a bit of life. I was, um, <laughs> I was um, 27, 28 when I found the scene. So I was, mm-hmm. you know, I'd had a, a fair bit of experience, um, but I had found that I had been self-sabotaging relationships mm-hmm. um, because I wanted to be sexually submissive, but I didn't know how to talk about it. So I was kind of putting myself in situations that were unspoken, which is really the worst way you can do power exchange. And I also had been fairly sexually active. I mean, I had a lot of sex by that point. Uh, so I'm bisexual. So I had experience with women. So, but I think that the, the thing that coming into consensual non-monogamy and kink gave me was the ability to speak about it, to conceptualize it, to talk to other people about it. Like we don't talk to other people about sex, right? Yeah. It, it takes coming into one of these communities to, to learn how to talk to other people. And I just found that so empowering, so, so much able to just understand what my own desires were and to go out there and set my own boundaries. It it was like my, at that transition was huge because my career took off. I started to get published. Um, my personal life took off. I ended up meeting my now husband in 1994 and uh, went into it saying, Hey, I'm non-monogamous and, um, you know, I'm going to be non-monogamous. And he was very much into that as well. And clearly has been ever since. Mm-hmm. So, um, so it really was kind of a pivot point for me finding the communities. Yeah. yeah I love that you say that. I think because one of the things that is so, right. Everybody's so afraid of being ostracized or isolated or cast out of their community. And when you find, when you find a community that supports who you are, like, do you want to be cast out of your church? No, you don't. But you also have now the confidence of knowing I have a group of other people who will wrap me in their arms, take me in and say, no, you're, you're not wrong. You're not bad. You're one of us. Even like, again, you don't ever want to get kicked out of any community, whatever it is, but to find one that does accept you, it gives you that place to feel home. And it's, and then you can start talking and speaking your truth without that fear. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that there's a risk. There's a risk to family. If you're out Mm -hmm. of, that's one of the hardest things that I see is when somebody who's from maybe even a religious background gets outed to their family, that can be just devastating to their dynamic. Mm -hmm. However, finding your chosen community and, and it's even just 
bigger than a group because you can find a great group of people and, and it clicks. And that's why you see these groups of people meeting with each other, going on cruises year after year and, you know, knowing each other for 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, that's like a part of your life. Mm -hmm. So I think that that really adds uh, to your life and it balances out the risk of what might um, happen to other communities. But we're also finding there's a lot of religious um, institutions that are so much more accepting of this and yeah. so much more yeah. understanding of the fact that we're doing this ethically, we're doing this consensually, and um, we're doing this to enrich our relationships. For yeah. sure. Yeah. And I picked religion. It could, it could be your kickball team. I mean, it could be anything <laughs> that could like say, Oh, we don't want Susan. She, she's dating that couple. Right. And so you know, <laughs> any, co any community family you're part yeah. of. Yeah. I, I'm curious the, for you, the drive to not just get involved in the community, but to like sort of, but cause it's easy. The, let's say the example you said, like, Oh, we meet every year to go on a cruise together. And I think not all, but a lot of those people are like, those are our cruise friends and they stay over here with our cruise friends. And we see them, you know, once a year, maybe once every four or five months. And then we have our other friends and the never the two shall cross. And it sounds very much like you're like, I'm me. I'm just going to like mush them all together and, and go out and like live my life. How do you, how do you arrive in that place? I mean, even at 27, it's not, yes, you're, you're not 18, but you're also still, you know, in your twenties. Yeah. You know, I, I, I was a girl scout. <laughs> I have to say I was activated as a young child to go out and do for other people and for the community. And for me, this kind of giving back is, is super important. So I've always volunteered. And then when I was outed, it kind of created a power ranger. I mean, it really all kind of came together <laughs> in one big giant model where it was like, I, I just felt this no, <laughs> coming out yeah. of me. I'm not yeah. going to stand for this. And so I started working with amazing mentors, mainly in the gay male Leatherman's community, because uh -huh. they had been having to fight the AIDS crisis was still in bloom. And uh, I was also seeing wonderful, I had lesbian mentors because they were really kind of taking on a lot of the organizational um, tasks and um, trying to help in this crisis. And so I was really surrounded by a lot of great people like the LGBT center in New York city was kind of our home where we would go. So I was exposed to a lot of other groups and I saw people fighting for their rights. And I didn't see anybody fighting for the rights of kink and non-monogamy people. And so I started working on different projects. One of them was for the national organization for women, because I'd been a, a now member since I was 16 and I, I was shocked to find out that they had an anti-kink policy. And this anti-kink policy was helping to fuel these women on women attacks at places like the Michigan Women's Festival. Um, and so I, I was like, no, that's just wrong. I mean, this is, this shouldn't be allowed to go on. And so I organized like a three, three and a half year project where I trained volunteers to talk to chapters. I got statements of support from people. And we ended up getting now to rescind their anti-SM policy. Wow. So I had kind of this experience, yeah, before I started NCSF. Yeah. And um, really realized, oh, wow, you know what? You can, you can build allyships. You can, and that's still a really important uh, part of NCSF's work is we, we work with allies. Like right now we work with a lot of anti-violence projects because we, we want to support their work. The work that they're doing is really golden. And by creating those relationships, we can work on legislation. We can work to change institutional regulations that help cause this discrimination against us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's powerful work. It is. <laughs> it is. Yes. I know we could dive into all of that and we're going to it's weave hard. it in. We'll weave it in throughout I know. the whole I was thing. like, it's how beautiful. do I cover like 25 years of life with your relationships and your, your personal life, mm -hmm. plus all of the amazing, incredible mm -hmm. work you're doing in like an hour podcast? How do we do that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had to keep things a little high level um, with, with details here and there. Uh, but I'm curious. So I, we're going to weave in the work that you've been doing all along. But as you know, in your your relationship, you mentioned meeting your husband around in the mid nineties and, or your now husband and how he was her then husband too. Well, depending <laughs> when you got married, you don't know that. 
<laughs> but uh, um, what did your, I guess, relationship uh, structure and life look like? Uh, well, it, we, it, we were together for five years before we got married. Mainly we got married because um, we needed to, like health insurance. I mean, there's mm-hmm. a lot of things that come with being married that is a privilege that married couples should be aware that they have. But we we uh, we were non-monogamous from the beginning. There's been times that we've closed down our relationship. And I think it's good for couples to be uh, aware of that, that, that there's sometimes you have to focus on the couple. You have to focus on the challenges, like if there's health challenges or family issues. Um, I've seen friends of ours like kind of close things down when they have really young kids because they're dealing with the kids. Right. Um, so there's been, there's been times that we've kind of closed it back, closed it down and then we open it back up again. And, um, a lot of our consensual non-monogamy is I think what you would call an open relationship in terms of, we do a lot of things together. You know, we like to go to clubs. We like to go to parties. And even if we don't play, we like to be in that atmosphere. We like to be talking to people in that atmosphere, right? So that's a a large part of our sex life together is actually going on these sexual adventures together. And then we've also had the kind of what you would call polyamory, where there's been times where we've had, you know, a lover. And that person has is is typically friends with benefits, Um, rather than a a real romantic relationship, like a hearts and flowers, (laughs) because we don't do that with each other so much. I mean, Kelly's wonderful about giving me little gifts. He'll find something that he likes, Mm -hmm. but we're not big on the whole Valentine's Day Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. type type romance. Um, We're partners, you know? And so that's kind of how we that's kind of how we deal with our consensual non-monogamy. A lot of times I'll know somebody for a while before I'll start to have a more intimate relationship or I'll play with them. Uh, So yeah, that's kind of our dynamic. Yeah. I love it. When, when you and Kelly kind of came together, did you start exploring pretty much right away together in this, in just various capacities, sort of figuring out what was going to work for the two of you? Yeah, because he, uh, we met because I was advertising the, the 1994 leather celebration on a, uh, on cable network. Right? <laughs> and he saw me and he was like, Oh my gosh, I want to get to know her. And so he kind of tracked me down at one of these groups that I was attending. So the, our first date, I mean, like I, I knew him for months, several months, and then I wanted to go to a party and I thought, Oh, why don't I ask this really nice, safe guy? <laughs> to go with me. And so I did. And he said, yeah. And so he reached out his hands and he kind of touched my hips and kind of pulled me in. And I, and my whole body went zing. (laughs) I was like, wait a second. I think I've gotten into more than I, I thought I would, I was getting into here. So that was our first date as we went to a party together. Wow. I love it. And you met on the original Tinder cable, cable television. (laughs) He's trying to swipe the screen. Like, yeah. <laughs> swipe right, swipe right. So true. He's like qu- looking and he's like saying, oh, wow, NLA Metro New York. And he's writing it down. Okay, I'm going to fly- track them down. Yeah. And he did. He came in and he didn't even let me know. Otherwise, I would have been like, eh, right? right? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. he was super smart about it. It was like, you know, eight months later, he's like, by the way, <laughs> yeah. now this, that you know me, now I'm a trusted entity. This, be, this, this happened. <laughs> this will be flattering in a year. Right now, it's stupid. Exactly. <laughs> right now, it feels very stalkerish. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but look where you're at today. <laughs> yeah, no, he was very smart about it. He didn't come in and come right at me. He came in and like, you know, to meet me and to get to be friends with me. And I think so yeah. few people realize that they, they go straight for the sex. And it's like, no, you, you talk to the person like they're a human being yeah. and you get to know them. And, um, you know, I think that that's the way you go about yeah. this. I mean, anybody yeah. who comes at me right at like, uh, sex, ah, yeah. um, you know, thinking I'm swinging from the rafters or something like that. And they could just say, snap their fingers. And I'm going to, I'm going to, it's like, no, that's a complete turnoff. Yeah. You know, I want somebody who wants to get to know me. And that's what he did. I mean, 
Yeah. It's coming at that, you know, getting to know someone with that curiosity, just curiosity of who is this person? I just want to know this person. I don't know where this is going to lead. Maybe nowhere, maybe, maybe somewhere. I don't know, but let's see, let's just have this have human to human conversation and see what happens. <laughs> I know. I think we focus so much on, on the sex and the consensual non-monogamy and really what it is, is being open to create whatever relationship you can with each person. And that could be acquaintance. That could be a good friend. You know, that could be somebody who, who turns out to be like a life support for you. That could be somebody who's a lover for six mm -hmm. months, a year, you know, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's the freedom of being able to explore relationships that, um, that, that you're not trying to just put them, put people into pigeonholes. You're more looking at the person and seeing what develops naturally. The, I hate expectations. And I think consensual non-monogamy really removes a lot of expectations from relationships. Yeah. yeah. That was very beautifully said. Yeah. That you don't have to be somebody's everything. Yeah. You can, you can meet a certain set of needs and they can go get the other ones met somewhere else if they would like to. Right. Yeah. But at the core of it, it's Absolutely. about treating each other as human beings. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah, that I, some, sometimes that just gets lost. Yeah. And having been in such a long relationship over so many years, relationships change. And mm -hmm. uh, I, when I look at the monogamy model and locking somebody in, I think that's why people become adversarial within these relationships and they can't, they can't move and change as easily. Um, whereas in long-term non-monogamy relationships that I see, it's very fluid. You're able to change as, as people change, people naturally change. With yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is, which is actually, I was, I was trying to figure out how to ask the question because one of the things that we've, we ask people sometimes if they're say they've been together 20 years and then they open their relationship, we'll often say like, well, how have you seen each other change in the last three or four years since you've opened your relationship? Because often there's a period of a stagnation is a bit harsh, but like there's a period of like, we find a groove and then we break it. And now all of these things start happening, but you and Kelly were basically doing this from roughly day one. So it's, I think the question is more like how, what are the different relationships that you and Kelly have had that, that your, your marriage has probably taken on various relationships of itself. And how is, how has that looked over the years as you have each learned about yourselves, learned about each other and learned about your relationship? Yeah. I think that, you know, in the beginning, we went to a lot more parties. I have to say we, <laughs> we were staying up a lot later. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, it was more of a regular part uh, of our lifestyle. And then of course, you know, when you jump all the way to, to more recently, COVID had a devastating impact mm -hmm. on, yeah, on for sure. everybody's ability to get out. I've only just started going out to parties again. So yeah, it's been different because, you know, over a 30 year relationship, you know, we've had health issues, you know, we had the whole, do we have a family or not, you know? And so, and then we moved from New York city 10 years ago out here to Phoenix. That was a huge transition, set up our own business. So during different times of stress, you know, we have to, we have to make sure and prioritize our relationship. And that's why I tell people who are coming into this, who have been together already for a while, and they're like opening up a relationship, you know, go into it as a team. Um, we communicate, we have our safe words with each other so that if a conversation is happening where it's kind of going off rails or the dynamic is going off rails, we can signal to each other. We're in it as a team. And I think that has stayed the same throughout. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's helped our relationship, even at times where we've been, you know, we both had lovers or times where we've both been completely monogamous with each other because we're mm -hmm. dealing with a situation in our lives. It's, it's still, we're team, we're teammates in this. Yeah. And so you have to like, look at sometimes these things that you're doing and go, well, you know, maybe, maybe now is not the right time for me to be saying, Hey, I really want to go to this party. You know, maybe that's going to put stress on, on our relationship in a way that's not good. So you have to like, even though it's supposed to be the ultimate freedom, when you're, you've got a team member, you have to take your team member into account. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and I'm, I'm offer the, another question of, and this is something that perhaps we've seen as well. We've, you know, having been open for 17 ish years, we've, we've go through a lot of those same ebbs and flows of, 
you know, for a summer or a year, like we're not really doing a whole lot, but the, then going from, again, another question, I don't know how to ask necessarily, but (laughs) going, going from the, like, we're, we're in the, the, the closed down, you know, the, the, the trough as it were to the back to the, like, we're opening back up. Sometimes for us, there were times where it was like, that's almost the thing you need to rebuild the connection between you. And I was just curious, like, do you, you, you said like, there are times where we're like, okay, we need to just close the circle up and turn inward to this, the two of us. Do you ever see the, like the exploration, the BDSM, the, the swinging, that, that being the thing that's like, that's, what's going to pull us back together and get us back on whatever track it is that we want to be on right now. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you say that it, it definitely, Sometimes like, like just take this latest one. We, we moved out here. We kind of closed things down a little bit. We were trying to find community because like, you know, building a new community after you've come from one that's so Mm -hmm. established and rich and all of our friends. So we were out there trying to establish our relationships in this community, this local community. So we, I, we both just didn't dive into it. I mean, I think it's just kind of experience of, Let's take it slow. And, um, and then, and then it kind of got to a point where it was like, oh, you know, I felt like kind of, I was missing something, right? Like I was missing that excitement from it. And so it was kind of like, okay, let's, let's, let's start going out again. Let's start doing something. Let's go to the swing clubs here locally. Right. And Mm -hmm. check out what's happening and go to some of these parties that are happening. And, it really was amazing because it kind of rejuvenated us in mm-hmm. some ways. You know, we ended up actually going on a couple's cruise uh, for, we had the NCSF table out by the pool. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really fun. It was really fun. So we had a, a series of like really fun, exciting things happening. And we're really starting to feel kind of clued into the whole, like that went on for some years. And then of course the pandemic yeah. has really wiped out the past few years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Although I just went to a really fun Halloween party. So, oh yay, that's amazing. <laughs> uh I'm curious. You know, you've mentioned that your relationship has taken many forms. You kind of go in and out of different parties and different experiences throughout your relationship. Have there been situations where either one of you has had a more long-term serious or an- another romantic partner? Yeah, there Kelly did at one point. Um had for it was like almost 2 years. And it was, but again, it was more like friends with benefits. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? So we've, we, I don't know if that fits your criteria of a romantic, you know? I don't know. I I, I think it's up to whatever those, like whatever those people decide. (laughs) It's hard to, to maybe a more serious, a more serious, like one-on-one relationship rather than like the parties is what I'm thinking. Right. Yeah. So yeah, he had um, a girlfriend for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then more recently, I had a lover for almost a year, you know, Mm -hmm. so we, it, it, it usually is not simultaneous. And I think people have to realize that, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of working parts. If you have two people, you know, being able to get that at the same time, and especially it, I think it's just such a fantasy, the whole idea of two couples getting together and then having that perfect mesh. I think it can happen for a while, but I think it's very tough to, Mm -hmm. to actually really find that um, Mm -hmm. sort of situation. So yeah, no, there's been times and, um, you know, and then that brings its own special challenges when one of us is sitting at home and the other is (laughs) having fun. Um, But, you know, I think part of it is we're just so honest with each other about it and we talk about it beforehand. And certainly I know that I personally, if I feel like there's an issue, um, I'm going to prioritize Cal, you know, and, uh, and then work through whatever issues are happening in that area. And, and that's really stood us in good while we're doing this. Yeah. And, and as you're, or in your ability to continue in the relationship that you and Kelly have built, right? So the, it sounds like in, a, in most cases, you two are the primary sort of entity that moves through. And yeah, you have some, I think the term sometimes people throw out there's like satellite partners and, and it sounds like a year long relationship or even a two year relationship that I t- feel like that's a bit more than a satellite, but it's also what the two people who are in it 
call it, right? And, you know, you were like, well, I don't know if that meets the criteria, but I think the criteria are, there really aren't any. And the two people who are in the relationship create the relationship and they're like, we're going to see each other, you know, once a week or we're going to see each other once a month. And they set what feels good. There's no like governing board of directors that says, well, you have, you have seen each other twice this month. You are now a level seven polyamorous. Like it, it's just such a weird amorphous thing. <laughs> well, it's so funny because um, it's only been fairly recently that all these distinctions have mm-hmm. been made. You know, I mean, for most of my existence, it was, I called it poly, polyamorous, you mm-hmm. know, um, and I, I went to swing parties or sex clubs, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it just seems like now people are trying to define this more like polyamory. It has to be romantic relationships or it has to be non hierarchical romantic relationships. And it's like, um, I don't know. I was there like, like when they first started using the word. And um, <laughs> it seems to me like what I am is polyamorous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the terms, like, each person can define them for themselves. Like, the, the to me, the name, the term, whatever you decide to use is a starting point for a conversation, right? Like, yeah, because in your experience, it's so different from, like, you've had the, you know, you have the history, you have the information of, like, we just started using this term. <laughs> and then people, you know, who uh, may not have had that experience, you know, are trying to figure out in this, like, soup of terms that are out there now of like, what do I use to label myself? I don't really want to be a label, but I have to like start somewhere to describe what I like, what, where I'm at in my relationship. So it's hard to figure out that, that point. And I do think it's a good point that, um, it's a start. It has to mm-hmm. be the conversation because even if you say I'm polyamorous, I mean, conversation has to happen after that. Well, what do you mean by that? what does that mean to you? And, um, I find the same thing in kink. It's just not enough to say, Oh, are you into rough sex? That means nothing. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally nothing. Yep. Um, it's the start of a conversation. It's, it's not a yes or no answer. <laughs> so, and I would like to see people not using the labels as much and just describing what it is that they're interested in um, yeah. rather than, than defaulting to the labels. So it looks like we might be kind of going through this and coming out the other end where, where labels are less important, which would be great. Yeah. Right. And that's, it's interesting too. you brought up the point point for us of the ongoing conversation of why we keep our, the, each of our episodes are just the name of the person that we talk to. And we've talked about whether we should put more descriptions in there because then people can find information easily. But we we're like, no, the name of the person is the, is, is what we keep doing because it's like, they can talk about whatever, however they identify, whatever labels they want to use. And if, if any labels, and we don't feel like we can put those labels, we can use some generalities to describe the situation, the conversation, but that's about it. Like we can't label people. Like it's, you can't put people in a box like that. It's too hard. (laughs) And I think that's what we're fighting is the idea of putting people in boxes. (laughs) That's like kind of where the anti-box category. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, something in there that you, 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 touched on briefly, Susan, was somebody sitting at home while somebody else is out on a date. Oh, yeah. And I think that maybe opened up the question for me of, were there or have there been things that you and Kelly have challenges you've you've faced over the last 30 years of navigating this? Or has it just been easy peasy, everybody's happy every day, no problems? We assume it's the latter. Anybody who says that, if they're doing this, uh, then 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 you got to wonder. I mean, I hear that sometimes about like couples saying that they don't fight. I'm like, how can you not have an <laughs> argument? You know what I mean? It's somebody is not standing up for what what they think or want. Yep. Um. So no, of course, there's been huge challenges in this, and, and I think it is because sometimes I do feel like we're hacking through a jungle with a machete, Mm -hmm. you know, one step at a time, because a lot of it is dealing with old stuff when you're growing up, childhood issues, family issues. Um, All of that stuff gets brought up uh, when you're challenging yourself and challenging your partner. So yeah, no, we've had, we've worked through that. 
you know, therapy is an amazing thing. I, I recommend it for everybody uh, because it helps also teach you to talk about yourself and self-examine. And I think it's very hard to be consensually non-monogamous if you haven't self-examined yourself or willing to look at your motivations. And so, yeah, you know, jealousy, I think is, is a very natural thing. And it's like, where do you find when jealousy is something that's um, self-destructive or destructive to the relationship uh, when you're trying to be controlling with your jealousy or when your jealousy is pointing out that um, you're going off track, that there's, there's an issue, there's a lack, there's something that needs to be talked about as Mm -hmm. far as I'm concerned to, to renegotiate what's happening. Um, I loved it that Cal would, you know, bring me ice cream and so I'd have a tub of ice cream and then he'd be like, I see you later. You know what I mean? So I could sit there and watch Downton Abbey with my yeah. ice cream, you know, <laughs> it's like, um, and that just got that kind of care for me, that kind of consideration on his part when I'm going out and being all like, well, have fun for me, that deepens my feelings for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, then, you know, he's, yes, he's excited and he's going out on a date he's probably going to have fun. But he also thinks of you, he thought of you before the date, he'll think of you after, and he'll probably even think of you while he's on it at, at, at certain points. But that it's those touch points that remind you that like, oh, he's not just, he's not casting me aside while he goes and finds the Susan 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> right. I yeah. think, uh, yeah, the, the, I don't think that non-monogamy is a good way to, to, to find your next partner. <laughs> I, I think anybody who goes into this going, okay, well, my relationship is not so great. I'm going to start dating other people and hopefully find that, that next, but I just don't, I, I don't think it's a great idea. If for one thing, you're going into it with the other person who's, who should be understanding the idea that this is non-monogamy, mm-hmm. you know, and they're opening up their mind also to the idea of not putting you into a pigeonhole. And so if you've got an ulterior motive, of like, oh, I'm just out there kind of dating around before I actually leave this person. I just don't see that working at all. It's just mm-hmm. too, yeah. It's go- it's going to implode of its own weight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and at the same time, I mean, we we've talked to a lot of people about this, and what we often not often, but what we have seen as well is the sometimes they don't know, and you get in, and non monogamy is a magnifying glass, or it pulls. It pulls the the camouflage off of what you've been hiding and because it's it's a lot harder to hide things in your relationship when you're doing it in a non-monogamous fashion. And so we've we have seen that where people we we have some friends who've almost it was two couples and they've almost flipped. And it Isn't wasn't interesting. Yeah, neither of them went into it thinking this is what we want to do. We're looking for a replacement. But along the path they uncovered things, the other couple uncovered things, and they've sort of found a better, I don't know, even better is the right word. They've just sort of naturally evolved into that new dynamic. And so it's- Isn't that interesting? Yeah, Yeah, it is. It's like a crucible because because this Mm -hmm. much radical honesty, I mean, you have to- you have to be digging in yourself too, because, you know, mm-hmm. you hide a lot of stuff from yourself, you know, it's, it's very easy. So you have two people who are hiding stuff from themselves um, and they decide to open up their relationship. Yeah. I, I definitely think it's a crucible. It, it, it definitely will intensify whatever issues that you have. And because you start talking, I think if you start talking about sex in your life, you can talk about any other issue in your mm-hmm. life. And so I think it opens the floodgates to talking about a lot of different things. Especially Mm -hmm. sex with other people. (laughs) Yeah. You think sex with sex is taboo to talk about. Imagine talking about it. That orgy we were at. (laughs) You remember that time? Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, broaching those conversations or the, you know, there's a lot of people we talk to that have to broach the conversation of opening up a long-term relationship. That's a long-term monogamous relationship. And one person wants to change it, right? Like that's very common and uh, trying to figure out the other maybe doesn't. And the other maybe doesn't like trying to figure out those conversations. Like it's not easy, but at the end of the day, like, yeah, if you can talk about sex and intimacy and relationships in your life and in your, like in your relationships, like it, it, it opens the door for so much more conversation. That was my point, but it can be, it's not like it's easy all the time. 
No, and I, I actually kind of like it that it's not easy. I, I, I don't yeah. want to settle into a groove. I, I, I would yeah. rather be doing taking the hard steps. And sometimes when you're reopening, it can feel very difficult. It's yeah. you're wondering, are you going to be destabilizing the relationship? Um, but I've just kind of stuck to this path of, I just really feel this philosophy is right for me um, as a human being. And while being respectful, especially of my, my, my partner, mm -hmm. um, you know, just carefully going one step forward at a time, I, it can be done. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even with a partner who may be hesitant, I would suggest definitely getting into therapy to talk it through. Oh yeah, um, totally. Because it's, it, it totally, it's, it, it can, it could be that it's really not about non-monogamy and that's why it's good to have a professional who can help kind of guide the conversation and you can get a kink and polyamory aware professional. NCSF has our kink and polyamory aware professionals database. It's super helpful for a couple to go. And a lot of these people are sex therapists. So they'll actually be talking about your own sexual relationship as well, your own romantic relationship. They kind of focus it from that point of view. And that can just, I've seen it just be tremendously helpful for couples yeah. who are opening up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. And yeah. I think maybe what would be good to do is balance this scale out a little bit because we just said, well, this shit's really hard. And you and Kelly had lots of hard things and you're living in you're you're on the crucible all the time. But what's what's the other side of that? If you're you're you said it sort of magnif well, we all said it magnifies the hard. What is it what has it done for you and Kelly's relationship? Obviously it hasn't destroyed it. Did it like, has it made it stronger? Has it like, we're looking for the positive. Part. Yeah. What's the positive? <laughs> what's the, what, why do this? If, if all it is, is negative, right? A negative risk. There's a risk. We're going to blow up our marriage. What's the positive side of it? Oh, it's such a huge positive. Um, for one thing, I do feel like we can get through anything together um, because we have gotten through so many things together. So even things outside of the non-monogamy, right? Yeah. So I think it helps build that real stable foundation for the relationship. And I think it, I think also from a personal point of view, because I've been able to make personal choices, even within a relationship, um, I don't, I don't feel a lot of that resentment or um, stifling or like I've had to like cut off parts of myself in this relationship. So I am very happy right now. I'm really, really happy in my personal life and my relationship. And I think that that hard work, you know, like, like I said, the crucible, if you don't go through that hard work, you can end up kind of drifting apart, getting locked into certain positions where there's kind of this underlying, just low level dissatisfaction, you know, or even higher level dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I actually really feel like, because I, I feel like if I can say anything, you know what I mean? I can, if I have an issue, I can sit down and talk to him. I know how to do that now. I know when to do that now. I mean, little things because, mm -hmm. you know, how you approach somebody and how, how they deal with issues, you know, it, it, you need to work that out together. So I think I would not have wanted to do anything different because, um, this is how I wanted to live my life. This is how I continue to want to live my life, even though I'm moving into the senior years. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm kind of going, wow, can I keep doing this at this point? Um, but then I remember that when we were, we were first together, we went to a club together and we looked over and we saw this older couple. They must have been in their 70s. And, um, you know, they're wearing their gear and, and they both have big smiles on their face. And Kel said something about that's going to be us someday. <laughs> and I thought that's a wonderful thing to be someday. You know, <laughs> that's something to aspire towards. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I love it. I remember one of our trips, we, we went to, we've been to desire a few times. And then one of the trips we were on the shuttle from the, like the airport to the, to the resort. And we were sitting there and talking to this guy and he's like, yep. The the the, ho the the airport shuttle picked me up at the retirement home this morning, and here I am. And he's like, he went went from retirement home to Desire and to spend the whole week. And it's like, good for you. It like, was amazing. Yeah, it's a, incredible. Why and, not? Right? right? I mean, come on. <laughs> right? Right? Well, and I, I just wanted to really quick circle back to your 
to your point of like i think the flip side that i wanted to point out was it 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 can make your it highlights potentially all of the the cracks right it can amplify the cracks but as to your point if you can if you can heal those if you can work through those what you come out on the other side is like an intense strength that you too can move through the world in a very different way and you're not hiding any like you said you're not hiding who you are because we you know you made the comment about well if two people say they've never fought who's hiding what and i think that's the piece somebody in that relationship is probably going along to get along probably not living the life they want to live and you're not doing that you and your husband or you and your partners can all come to the relationship and say this is what i want this is who i am are we going to be a good fit and we can talk about it honestly and so i think it's just a to highlight the like the ability to work through the challenges, what that does to strengthen the foundation. And yeah. you, you said it beautifully. And I just, that was, I wasn't truly doubting there was a positive side. I was curious what it was for you and Kelly as you've done this for almost 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. And I think actually being older now, I'm going to be 60 yeah. next year. It's, um, you know, as you get towards the more towards the later part of your life, you want to look back and go, you know, did I live as fully as I could? And boy, do I feel like I lived fully. And I think that that's, um, that's an amazing thing. And having a partner who supports me in my work. Oh my gosh. She's like the first NCSF volunteer. I mean, I may have founded it, but he was right there from the beginning. It really has been kind of a, a joint effort. Yeah. between the two of us to, to build this thing together. Oh, it's just, it's amazing. I, I really do recommend, I mean, now that I've had all this time and I can say, yes, this is a very positive thing. I think any relationship is going to have cracks or whatever differences. I think it also blows apart the idea that somebody has to be a hundred percent right for you. It, yep. It's yeah. just, nobody is a hundred percent right for you. Nobody is. There's going to be things that the person does that irritates you or um, things that you don't agree with. But that's giving grace, you know, especially to people that you love of like, okay, that's fine. That's just that thing that doesn't mm -hmm. invalidate them as a partner for me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely, <laughs> I definitely can recommend this and it's going to be interesting seeing what happens over the next 30 years together. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love that. Well, I think that's a great point that nobody's, and nobody's going to ever be a hundred percent right for you, but it sounds like what they've what what you and Kelly have allowed is for each other to be a hundred percent yourselves, and I think that's really like if we can be ourselves a hundred percent, yeah, we don't need to have the other person be a hundred percent match for who we are. They just we need to be allowed to be us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's being able to be a hundred percent yourself and being committed if you're in a partnership to the partnership. And mm -hmm. um, I've been very lucky to have a partner who understands that and has always been committed to the partnership. And I think that in consensual non-monogamy, you'll find that out pretty quickly. Um, you know, maybe I'm rethinking this. Maybe, yeah, if you have a troubled relationship, opening it up is a great idea because that'll really either you'll figure it out, you'll start to talk to each other and you'll work through it. Or you, you won't. Know, and allow each other or you won't. <laughs> Right. Well, and I, and I think that's important like, cause to hear that it's, it's not, you are like you and Kelly got into this. And if 20 years in, you're like, this partnership is not the right partnership for us, but we're committed to it. So we must do it against all odds. Like that's not, not quite maybe what you were getting at. It sounds like. No, definitely not. I mean, it, it your partnership has to enrich you and yeah. it has to support you. And, um, it has to be positive influence. It just doesn't have to be a hundred percent positive, a hundred percent of the time. Yep. You know, people have off days. Yeah. Yeah. Oh we, yeah. We've heard people come on and say before, like we, we definitely both want to quit. We just haven't wanted to quit on the same day at the same time. Oh, <laughs> quit your, your relationship. Quit, quit the yeah. relationship. Yeah, yeah. Quit the relationship. Uh, yeah. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. As long as somebody's in there hanging in. Yeah. yeah. And somebody's fighting for the relationship. You're get, you're, you are you can come back around and keep working on it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely think that there are some people that, that they get together. Like, you know, before I came into this and actually started being so open and talking about my desires, I, I wonder what kind of relationship I would have ended up in because, mm -hmm. um, I don't, maybe that wouldn't have been so healthy. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I want to dive in and talk a little bit more about your work, but I have one more question before, before we go there. Uh, I'm curious how you're obviously very open in all the work that you do and everything, but how has that journey been in, in being open about your work and all of the, everything? Well, let me rephrase that. How has that journey been in all of the work that you've done? How has it been to be out there? Let's like that. That's a loaded question. Yeah, I've been out there. I've been Susan Wright, <laughs> my name, you know, in, in kink and, and swing circles, uh, when everybody was using a pseudonym and still many people are, uh, I was Susan Wright. I was talking to the media, not because I'm an extrovert, but because somebody had to do it yeah. and I was willing to do it. And I was willing to use my full name. And, and because of that early experience, I decided I'm just going to completely be out there. And if a publisher doesn't want to work with me, they don't have to, but I will never be surprised again by somebody saying, I know who you are. And, um, I hated that feeling. So I've been completely open and it has, it has had no effect on getting books published on Mm -hmm. working with editors on, um, my family has been super supportive, uh, really supportive. And in fact, um, my nephew is a, Uh, a budding drag queen here in Phoenix. And so, um, yeah, no, our family dynamic is amazing. And so I've been extremely fortunate in that too, because I was working for myself as a writer and because I had a good family and a good partner, you know, I really haven't had a lot of the negative repercussions that I see through, Mm -hmm. uh, from NCSF. And, um, and I've helped plenty of people, you know, if somebody's going to be threatened, they're, they're, they've been threatened with being outed. It's like, I walk them through how to out themselves to their family, how, you know, how to broach it in a way that is, um, real sensitive without dumping a lot of the specific information on them so that they can kind of insulate themselves. So I think it's a, it's a great thing. I've seen a lot more people be out lately. Uh, which is very interesting dynamic. Um, as more people are out about this, more people hear about it and more people will join. Discrimination will go down. Yeah, which is, I was going to say, like, I would imagine your nephew, maybe he doesn't credit you for being a, becoming a drag queen, but you you showed him that you can be you and our family will support you. You sort of blazed that trail, at least to let him know it was safe, which is, which is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. He came out to me first when he was a young teen and, and just the anguish of that, of not knowing if you're going to be accepted, you mm-hmm. know, hearing that in his voice and being able to completely accept him and say, Oh, of course yeah. I understand. And I'm here. If you have any questions, I wish everybody had that in their lives. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which maybe brings us to the work that yes. NCSF does. And if you'd be open and willing to share a little bit more about how NCSF works, what you do, all of the things we want people how to How people learn can about. be involved. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's NCSF is great because we are a coalition of um, 180 groups, clubs, businesses, um, professional practices who serve kink and consensual non-monogamous folks. So as a coalition, we're all volunteer and true grassroots. So if people want to be involved, you can actually go to our volunteer page and sign up for our different committees. Um, we have an education outreach committee that gives workshops for, you know, groups and at big professional conferences like the American Psychological Association. We have a table there. We were the only exhibitor in this giant conference hall that is talking about adult sexuality Wow! for therapists, well, right? I know wow. it's, it's such a, it's such a thing that's needed. So all of our money that gets donated to us, it comes from individuals who are kinky or consensually non-monogamous, or it comes from groups doing fundraisers for us. We don't get grants. We are, we are in this on our own. Okay. I mean, even LGBTQIA grants will not give us, <laughs> foundations will not give us money. So all of the money goes to pay for that. We're all volunteers. So it goes to send us to these conferences. We do a ton of research. We've got 18 peer reviewed published papers out there with, um, based on our seven surveys. So we're able to do the research and ask the questions because we are 
the communities. You know, we understand the issues. We gather it through our incident reporting and response. So if you have an issue, you know, somebody's being discriminated against or they're sexually assaulted and they need help, they can come to NCSF and we'll connect you with the professionals or the resources that you need. And we track that data so that we know what the problems are in our community. So we really love it when people come and report to us so that we can know what's happening. And through that, we run things like the Kink and Polyamory Aware Professionals, which is the free database. We try to get as many professionals to sign up as possible. I mean, not just therapists and attorneys, but like massage therapists, mediators. Mediators have become a really huge thing because people are having more issues within the community and they need professional mediation. And then our biggest thing is our Consent Counts Project. That started in 2006 as a community-wide project, and we kind of took it on. And the goal of Consent Counts is to decriminalize consensual adult sexual behavior. So that includes kink as well as non-monogamy. We see a lot of regulations that keep people from opening clubs, for example. Um, uh, It's really horrible when you put, you know, $100,000, $200,000 into a business and then somebody who's a city official decides, oh no, this is no good, right? Like we need our meeting spaces. And so NCSF fights a lot for our meeting spaces. Um, and that falls under consent counts. And also we, we worked on um, decriminalizing kink. So we worked with the American Law Institute and they were revising the model penal code on sexual assault. First time since 1962. Wow. So you can imagine what that Assault. That's why we have a patchwork of sexual assault laws around the country. And we got them to write in a, a section for explicit prior permission for consent to kink. And um, that's the legal framework that's supposed to be used now instead of the case law. All the old case law you may not know says that you cannot consent to BDSM. I mean, you can't consent to hot wax. Specifically, you can't consent to using a writing crop on somebody because they call that assault. So we got that completely changed, and now this is being introduced in court. So anybody who's doing erotic force or restraint really needs to know these these five criteria that it takes to get explicit prior permission. Because, yeah. like, I just submitted an affidavit um, for a court a criminal court case saying it should have been introduced in the criminal court case because it probably would have affected um, the guy who's in jail right now, and he followed the criteria. Do you want to know the criteria? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's, um, you have to, explicit prior permissions means you have to actually specifically talk about what you're going to do. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're going to do bondage, if you're going to do any kind of flogging or spanking, you have to specifically say, okay, we're going to do this humiliation, um, and include if it's going to include some kind of sex, because otherwise, if you like tie somebody up and then start having sex with them, you're really kind of forcing them to have sex with you. You need to kind of get that ahead of time, which is why you have to have that conversation. So you have to uh, talk about that specifically and how intense it's going to be. You have to have a way to stop at any time. That's the second thing. And that's our safe word. And I really think a safe word is good for everybody who's doing a su- sexual exploration. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not, not just BDSM or kink. Yeah, no, non-monogamy, it's extremely important to have your safe word with your partner, especially so that you can let them know, because sometimes things can happen really fast. And yeah. sometimes you're embarrassed. You don't want to talk in front of a bunch of people or around you. But if you can just be like, oh, God, did you see that pineapple over there? You know, and then pineapple is your safe word. <laughs> you know, that kind of gets it across and in and, and a non-confrontational. Uh, and some people have trouble saying no. Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a way to stop at any time. The third thing is you have to agree if you're going to role play and say, oh no, no, don't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You have to agree to that first. Um, And then the last two things are really easy. You have to be of a sound mind when you agree. That means you can't be drunk. You know, you have to talk about it beforehand and you can't cause serious physical injury. Even if the person consents, you can't cause permanent disfigurement or permanent injury and yeah. you know we just that's not what you're not supposed to do that when you're having sex yeah. with somebody <laughs> yeah yeah and so even if it's a if it's an accident 
well, if it's an accident, you're still going to pay the price for it because uh, you're not supposed to seriously injure somebody. So that means things like, you know, there's this idea of choking that's come in with sex lately. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Don't, don't choke people when you're having sex. Seriously. First of all, most states have passed laws in the past few years that make it illegal to actually put your hand around somebody's neck and squeeze. Um, some states make it illegal to even put your hand over somebody's nose and, and mouth and impede the breathing. And it doesn't have to cause injury. It, it, we're finding through research that it causes such psychological problems to actually be choked that it causes long, longer term issues, even if you don't have the physical issues. And so, you know, role play choking, like where you just put your hand on somebody's neck, that can evoke those sensations that can make you feel vulnerable without actually cutting off somebody's breath. The, like the worst things we see are when people are just like, oh, you into rough sex? Okay, great. And then the next thing you know, somebody's being choked. That's so dangerous. You, mm -hmm. you can get killed that way. So we're, we're really working on a, on a campaign to let people know some things that, that, that you may think are okay are actually really dangerous. You know, yeah. don't, don't do this. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what our can consent counts program is working on. Yeah. Love it. Wow. So much amazing work. Like, thank you for sharing all of that. And thank you for all of the work that you do. And do you have follow up questions? I mean, I, I feel like we could ask you a million questions. That's the problem. No, I, I had a, co a comment about the, the city official who's shutting down the sex club, you know, you know, his, his browser history is just chock full of the kinkiest shit you've ever seen. <laughs> you know it, you know it. And so it's that's so what's so true. fucked up about it. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 No, it's so true. The, the phobia, the self, yeah. you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the phobia against what you want, it really comes out. And that was actually, that's one of our talking points. We help people, you know, we train spokespeople for groups and for businesses so that they can defend what they're doing. And that's one of the things we say is like, you gotta wonder at anyone who cares that much about what other people are doing sexually that they want to try to stop it. Like yeah. what's going on there? <laughs> what's going on with that person? Yeah. 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 yeah you don't want that all, sex club too be... close to home. <laughs> Well, and I understand about zoning, like you don't want it a residential area, although we see so many people doing house parties now, Yeah, yeah. it's, which technically you're not supposed to do it, it charge money yeah. for, sure. for coming to somebody's house. And, but so many of those are happening and partly that's happening because these cities are regulating out the ability mm -hmm. to have a legitimate yeah. business. Yeah. They, they don't so have any other they, option. Right. And you, you're not going to stop the desire to, for us to meet. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, that's what the United States was founded on freedom of <laughs> assembly. Right. Yeah. You know, like yeah. we have the right to meet with other like-minded people. And so we're really seeing the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to be able to turbocharge that. Um, yeah. we're going to be able to really start fighting back and, um, and, and get spaces where we can set up these legitimate clubs, have the certificate of occupancy, make sure it's all done well and legally and clean. And, um, and, and the fact that they have a consent policy to make yeah. sure that, and, 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 the you know, set them up as private membership groups where people have to look at a video first um, yeah, about the yeah. rules of the club. Um, yeah. I'm hoping that that's kind of the next big phase. Well, and how much better is like, is that the experience than having to go the like more underground way? Because you, it just, it just doesn't, sometimes it just doesn't make sense to me. I, I mean, I get it with the history of everything, but like in our, you know, in going to a party that's like more underground and you're trying to, you feel like you're like skirting rules. You don't know exactly what's going on. And like to have something be like, Nope, this is what it is. This is what you need to do X, Y, and Z to get in. And it's completely legal. And we're like, like, that's just so much, that's just so much more inviting. It's and safer and safer for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. And it doesn't cause parking problems for everybody else in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you like that's a legitimate concern noise you know like yeah yep. yeah know, we should we we shouldn't be forced to having to be having to have these house parties we should be allowed people who are interested in this should be allowed to be able to open their own business yeah yeah yeah, yeah and when i said too close to home like i think for for a lot of people it's the shame it's the shame like i don't want probably even the guy who's trying to get it shut down he's like well this is fine if it's on the internet and if it's a thousand miles away i'll go to the club 
But once you bring it here, then everybody here is going to know that I go to the club and I don't, and, or the people that I'm already interacting with, like, I just don't want, you know, it's well, that brings up a really good point of just like the societal shame too, yeah, like the, uh, around sex in general, like yeah. that's the shame that we all have, even about talking about it, about wanting it, about like, we're all human. Sex is a normal part of being a human. And yet the societal shame of even just talking about it is so huge that it, it's really hard for people to work past. Yeah. It, it also affects our lives directly. That stigma has a direct effect on our mental health. Totally. Um, P- we, we have far higher rates of PTSD of um, uh, suicide ideation because people are so ashamed of their sexuality and they're grappling with that. Um, that's NCSF's main goal is to destigmatize sexuality. Right. And mm-hmm. allow people the the ability to explore themselves and to, to because we see it when people come into our communities. You know that whole frenzy when people first find us. It's 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 the amazing gratitude that there's other people out there like you and and oh my gosh I can now explore this. Um, everybody should have that feeling. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Agree. Okay. Couldn't agree more. Well, maybe that's like the perfect <laughs> note to end on and just say a huge amount of gratitude to you, Susan, for, for sharing your story with us, but even more so for doing all the work you do to destigmatize mm-hmm. uh, what, what shouldn't have any stigma on it to begin with. So we appreciate it. And thank you very much. Well, I really appreciate that you allowed me to come on and talk to you all. I really do. Of course. Is there anything else that you would like to share uh, while we have you before we let you go? think so i think that's it except for let's do this again at some point yes i was just gonna say that let's we would love to dive in and more have more of these conversations let's definitely do this again and thank you so much for your time and we look forward to the next time and we're back thank you susan oh my gosh thank you for all of the amazing work that you do and have done for years and for coming on and sharing your story with us we're incredibly grateful and we're so excited to get this out there yeah i'm gonna nailed it i nailed it thanks thank you for the beautiful conversation (laughs) and all of your contributions to making the world a better place for all of us non-monogamists out there. Yes. A quick reminder, you can find links to everything that Susan mentioned in the podcast show notes on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. While you're there, you can also sign up for our upcoming virtual meet and greet February 23rd on the events tab. And oh yeah, we're going to be at Southwest Love Fest. That's in Tucson, Arizona, April 14th to 16th. And you can find links to sign up for that in the show notes as well. We're not just going to be there. We're going to be presenting a we're, workshop. We're going to be presenting a workshop, and you can save 10% off of your tickets with the offer code EMMA, yes. E-M-M-A. Yep. And I think that's it. Next week, we're going to be talking with Sarah, who is the other co-founder of Southwest Love Fest. And so we have an amazing conversation with her that we're super excited about. So come back and listen in a week. Do you have anything else? I think you would really regret it if you didn't come back next week and listen yes <laughs> that's all i'm gonna say always 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 right every day do you still agree that they should have brought their kids to this one i agree yeah although that conversation about us lurking in the and <laughs> <laughs> maybe you should have hopefully you skipped the intro a little bit and when i say us i mean you that was Whoa! i don't do that Whoa. all right Anyway, Emma, let's get out of here before <laughs> before we get those angry voicemails. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening.